stranded at home, build an overkill Katria's home lab. So in this talk, we are, um, I'm going to walk through all the steps I take to build my home lab during confinement. Um, we will start with setting some expectations and uh, kind of uh, explaining why I've done this. Uh, then the hardware, uh, Kubernetes, what kind of flavor of Kubernetes you want to get. Uh, then some network uh, tips and finally the application uh, that in the end you should be able to run on this thing. So um, the step zero expectation should be set pretty low. Uh, Kubernetes is really, really useless at home and um, all the stuff I've done, I could have done it without it. Uh, finally, my server was pretty old. So in the end, everything is very slow, but in the end it was really a lot of fun and um, and actually like it was something pretty nice to do during I mean uh, being stuck at home and having really much better to do. So I'm Enrico, I do automation infrastructure and DevOps consulting and um, you can reach out to me through my email uh, that's that's there and uh, on the internet I'm on Twitter, uh, GitHub and Twitch. Most of the work I've done uh, most of the work that I'm showing to you, uh, I try to do it uh, live in streaming and uh, that, that was helpful to kind of time box uh, the time I allocated to this project and more or less was about 5 to 10 hours per week. So you will see that in the end, you, I mean, it was not a lot of time in the end. Um, you can find some of the recordings on YouTube, but most importantly, every as much as possible was done through Ansible. So the Ansible code, of course, is online and uh, on, on the GitHub repo, you, pull, you will find uh, uh, the code that's used uh, for the server and also some of the code that's used on uh, the machine I normally uh, use every day. And um, some spoilers, the K3S Ansible module, uh, that there is an official one, that's the same for the OpenEBS ZFS operator. So the first thing you should think about is the hardware. Uh, when you work at home, well, when you need a server at home, I guess that you can um, kind of divide it in three big um, targets. So either you want a lot of storage, like a NAS, and that was actually my main purpose. I, I wanted to have backups for all my machines and I wanted to be able to access um, all my data from a central place. Either you want a media center, and uh, that means you might want to have GPUs to do transcodings or video, or you want actually an HDMI to plug it directly on your TV, or a mix of both. Or maybe you even want to have a lot of storage attached attach to that, so that would be another complication. Or maybe you just want to have some CPU and RAMs to do some just uh, normal service providing uh, of stuff that you might like to have at home. Uh, you will encounter three huge obstacles. The first one is budget, and uh, I will give you some of the details of the of my budgeting that was incredibly high. Uh, you will need to buy the hardware. Uh, that's not only actual servers. Uh, sometimes, well, most probably you will need also some network stuff, cables. Uh, maybe you will need to relocate your service in your apartment, so maybe you need to bring electricity and stuff like that. Then you need to count about the how much electricity all this thing will consume because you kind of expect to have them running 24 seven. And uh, noise is a huge factor because if you just get um, DC graded hardware, that stuff, it's incredibly noisy. Like we're talking about 90 decibel, like it, it's insane. You really don't want to put that in your apartment. And space too is a big thing. If you like me live in a shoebox in, in Paris, you, you can't really fit a full rack and uh, most probably not even another tower PC that would be an incredible solution to like save a lot of money and uh, um, even not having huge issues on assembling. But maybe you don't really have space for that, especially if you want to put that like in the living room or, or place like that. So um, the I pick a bunch of options that you can use as a base to think about the order that you want. 
The first one is the res are the Raspberry PIs. The latest version is like the four, and um, you can get up to eight gigabyte of RAM. There is a decent CPU. You have USB, you have HDMI, you have gigabit Ethernet, and uh, it costs like 90 euro. It is is as big as a camembert, so very easy to fit somewhere in in your apartment. Um, they also have a Raspberry Pi computing module that's a little bigger, like two camembert. Uh, it costs a little more, but you get a PCI Express, so that means you can actually attach uh, SATA drives, NVMe, whatever you like. And apparently it's p uh, pretty powerful too. So you just get the Raspberry Pi, some, some enclosure, and you hide it somewhere that should work. And actually you can get like two or three of them. They're kind of cheap. So you might get like a multi-node cluster or stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't find mine when I was doing all these things. So I didn't plug my Raspberry Pi, but I would really love to do that in the future. Another very good option is the Intel Nuke. So it's an actual real computer, just very small. You kind of pay the price to have something out of the box, uh, very small. We are really talking kind of the same size, a camembert. And um, you get a real CPU, like an i7, an i5, uh, real RAM, etc. cetera. Uh, there are different type of sizes. So you, there are some uh, bigger than the one in the photo here where you can actually put um, real disks. And finally, the options I choose, uh, it's the HP Microgen. It's a small server, uh, and um, there are two versions, the generation eight and 10. I guess they're kind of old at this point, but I mean, it's a real CPU and a real case and a real server and, and whatnot. So uh, that's kind of the version I have. And uh, you can put four real disks, well, real spinning disks inside. There is space for an SSD. Um, I managed to buy mine used for like 200 euro and uh, you just upgrade the RAM. And uh, at, at the beginning, we were talking about like five years ago, my idea was to just have a NAS. So I was like, okay, the Intel Celeron terrible CPU would, would be enough. Um, and I could have upgra upgrade to Axeon CPU for like 20 euro, but today the CPU that I would actually need is like 200 euro because I mean, there is a cheap shortage and, and stuff like that. Uh, this server is pretty nice because it gives you two gigabit ports. It's only one gigabit, but at least there are two. And um, I mean, very small, not so noisy. It uh, consumes like 200 watts. So pretty nice option. And well, after you pick the hardware, we need to install it. In my case, uh, I, I needed to uh, bring electricity to a, a corner of the of my apartment where, um, well, there was nothing, and uh, but was still accessible enough to wire the rest of the place with uh, with Ethernet. And um, well, it was fun to drill walls and install stuff. And in the end, uh, my budget was pretty high, <laughs> so. In here, I'm counting all the stuff I bought through the years. So, I mean, uh, that, that would be the cost if I rebuy everything today. We're talking about like four or 500 euro for disks. Then there is a server, the RAM, uh, a switch and a router, and then all the uh, small things to, I mean, wires and things that, that you need to plug, that I needed to plug electricity. Um, as you can actually see, like this is a huge, huge amount of money for, especially for the quality of stuff that I'm getting out of this. So totally do not think about it as a way to save money. It's just a very fun thing to do. And uh, I mean, we were confined, so there was no budget for bars and kind of replace it with this, right? Uh, oh yeah, and totally, you can actually get like a VPS or any cloud provider uh, space and, and uh, Compute time for kind of save money and you will get better things. But this is not about getting the better thing, right? So when your hardware is installed and everything should be fine, then you should think about what kind of Kubernetes you want in it. 
Um, to make this decision, I, was, uh, I went to the CNCF landscape website. I checked for Kubernetes distribution and I get 150 certified distributions. With some filtering, I, I get to like 90 of them that are kind of uh, feasible, like hostable things. Um, and then I went through all of them one by one. I started to exclude everything that was uh, not suitable for single nodes. So kind of most of them. And um, in the end, that was my short list. That was kind of four big things. So K3S and K0S, uh, Cube Spray that I actually tried. And finally, uh, I, I wanted to mention Kind, Cube Admin, uh, Minikube and Firecube because maybe those can be a good option for you if you want to try Kubernetes uh, on your current machines without buying new stuff or getting too crazy things. So kind, if you don't know, it's Kubernetes in Docker. So you can run Kubernetes just on your normal computer running in Docker. Minikube runs with um, uh, your a virtual machine manager, I, I guess with, with, with VirtualBox, it works pretty well. And uh, well, Firecube seems a lot of fun, I guess. Um, so in the end, I ended up with K3S. Uh, that's a um, very, very small distribution from uh, Rancher. And uh, it was very, very close to K0S. Uh, I guess I choose K3S because I already use some Rancher stuff and it was actually smaller than K0S. And I wanted to mention that I started with CubeSpray because my initial idea was, well, I'm using Ansible, so why not going with CubeSpray? Um, that in theory supports single node, but after like one hour of trying to get CubeSpray working, uh, I was kind of, uh, I mean, desperate. It totally didn't work for me. And uh, mostly also because my server was pretty slow to answer. So every try was very, very long. And so in the end, I switched to K3S and it takes 10 minutes to work. So yeah, go with K3S if you want something fast. And uh, that's how K3S is um, architected, let's say. So this is, I stole this image from their website. And the idea is that you have this huge, well, huge, these two processes, one that manages the server, one manages the, the agent, and um, they run all the piece of Kubernetes that you need inside of them. And then um, it's plugged to container D that runs your pod. So it's shipped. It's shipped with a, it's a 50 megabyte um, binary that uh, you can either install and configure using Ansible or with the binary comes a CLI that it just works and you can use it to configure and install your things. Um, and it works out of the box on single node, but you can add new nodes anytime and you can tell those nodes if they are server agents or both of them. So it was pretty nice and uh, I choose to install it with Ansible because I'm, I had kind of everything under Ansible up to that point. And, um, and yeah, that's the Ansible stuff. So as I mentioned in some slide before, you, there is an official um, module for Ansible to run K3S. So you, I, I just cloned that thing in my repo and I, my playbook is just importing that playbook, in fact. And um, there is some configuration that's basically the version of K3S you want to run um, and uh, some network stuff. So in my case, um, I wanted to specify, well, you have to specify uh, node IP and uh, yeah, I have to make very clear that that was a node IP in a lot of different places. But that's it, like in uh, less than, I mean, that's like 10 lines of uh, Ansible and everything just works. After, and actually this should have come before, but I mean, that was a huge mistake from my, uh, from my side. You will need to take care of network. So um, this was the first time I was actually trying to work for, like, let's say a long time on real hardware. I, I usually just worked with uh, cloud providers. And uh, I mean, network was a huge barrier for me in this situation. Um, I didn't plan for it in advance, 
So at the beginning, I just plugged everything together and it kind of worked because, I mean, it just worked. And then making changes after was a little more complicated because most of the times I was just kicked out of the network or things like that. Uh, I changed actually the hardware configuration. So the, the, I, I moved hardware from a room to another and uh, that was complicated because I have, it, I have to actually put new wires and that's not always easy. And uh, I mean, yeah, I was really used to have like virtual private clouds, security groups, stuff like that. And uh, that was way easier to manage than this. So in the end, I had my apartment cabled with one gigabit uh, LAN. Um, I would love to have 2.5 or 10 gigabit, but that's incredibly expensive, especially if you have to buy everything new. So you need new routers, new switches, new network cards on all your hardware. So that was kind of not an option for me. Um, I managed to put some VLANs to complicate my life actually. And I have WireGuard to access Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is exposing these services in my LAN, but to access the, um, the kubelet and kind of the master nodes, you need to be in the WireGuard um, network. So if you are inside my LAN, there, there is one computer that's uh, attached to the network. And if you are outside, so if you are on the internet, that thing is exposed so I can connect. If I'm from out of my home, I can actually connect to the server. That, that was pretty nice. And yeah, I did a lot of debugging and troubleshooting. It was in extremely painful to do, but fun. I mean, learned a lot of stuff. So I have kind of a network graph. Oh, I used to. Well, I can search for it, right? There we go. So, um, not the best of the graphs, but the idea is that I have my router and uh, mm, I, I changed my ISP router with a um, uh, Ubiquiti router that has uh, S, uh, freeze. Yeah, so I changed my ISP router with, um, I have fiber, fiber, that's the word. I have fiber on my router. I'm not gonna reshoot that. So yeah, you take the freeze. And um, so I plug the fiber directly on the thing. That thing is, has uh, the, the Wi-Fi access points, the three LANs from the server, two data and one for management and the other cable that goes to the to the switch that's in another room where the workstations are and that everything supports vlan for reasons and then there is wireguard running on the server that is accessible so it's exposed to the router from the internet and only from one vlan um it took me some time i could have kind of just used my isp router just work but it was a, this was a lot of fun. Like it was nice to uh, you know take some time to configure router and uh, um, kick myself out and have to go to the other room. That was fun. Um, yeah. So after you got your all your stuff working, um, software. So software wise, I already had um, a NAS running on that on that machine and. Uh, that was using ZFS for the, for the data. And so I thought, well, it would be nice to have ZFS also available on Kubernetes. And I kind of like plan an entire day to plug those two things together. I searched and OpenEBS was the best option for this. And uh, I never used OpenEBS before because I always use Kubernetes with kind of native drivers. In, in my case it was for uh, AWS. So storage was just there. And, um, and yeah, in the end, I just did the kubectl apply open EBS ZFS operator and it just worked. So it was kind of annoying how good it was. Um, and yeah, the way it works is that you create a ZFS pool that you want to use with Kubernetes. You install the operator and, uh, and then you just have to configure what's the pool that the operator should use. And that's it. It, uh, it just works. Uh, that was incredibly good. 
And so now from uh, my Kubernetes cluster, I can create PV and PVC that are actually sourcing data from the, from the pool. And, um, and it works, that's pretty nice. I installed some other stuff. So I have FlexCD running on the thing. So I can actually, uh, when I'm working on some personal project, I can test them on, uh, to be deployed automatically on the cluster. FlexCD right now it's uh, fetching from, from GitHub, but uh, the plan is to try also to host maybe GitLab or Git e or some other Git uh, things in the server also to use some of the storage. Um, I have Grafana that works pretty well and it, sh it mostly shows how slow is my server, but I mean, there is some data, some dashboard, that's funny stuff. And then there is a Plex server that I, I try to readapt the um, container version that they provide you. It works, I'm not so happy with that, but uh, I guess it's because my hardware is, is pretty bad. And, um, and yeah, I, I can just deploy whatever chart I want. Uh, I have Plex CD, so I just plug things and uh, it works on the cluster. That was pretty fun. Um, so finally, just before wrapping, um, uh, more details on ZFS, that's pretty fun. It's pretty solid. I never had an issue in, in years at this point. Um, they really doing their best to make sure that the data that you're writing and reading is uh, as correct as possible. They support RAID uh, natively, so I can actually extend my pool, plugging new disks, and uh, it's uh, directly managed by ZFS. You don't need any hardware or soft, extra software layer. And they have snapshots. Snapshots are the best thing ever. You create your snapshot, it's like ZFS save, something like that, and uh, you, you get a tar GZ. You get a tar thing that you can actually push wherever you like, like to Amazon S3. So to back up the data, it's really just a one-liner thing. Uh, if, like in my case, the data is like five terabytes, maybe you want to split that, but I mean, same thing. It's very fast and very cool. And uh, open EBS, I did get a, a little, Meaning, I mean, I spent 10 minutes configuring that thing. So I was like, okay, maybe it's worth understanding a little better how it works. And um, yeah, uh, TLDR is just, it's awesome. Like whatever storage you have, you put this thing in the middle and you get it on Kubernetes. That's it. It was very nice and incredible project. So to wrap this up, running Kubernetes at home, it's a complete waste of time and resources. Managing your network is very, very hard, like way more than I expected. Those 30 minutes are totally not coming back. And uh, I mean, the, big, the biggest thing that I found was, was that it was the first time I was working from A to Z to a project and I was completely alone. I was very used to working a team. And um, I mean, this time there was nothing else. So every time I stopped, every time I found any kind of barrier or I had to choose something, I was completely alone and uh, that was way harder. So I guess that the um, biggest lesson learned it's about teamwork and about, I mean, having somebody that can help you and uh, where you can count when you build your stuff. And uh, yeah, it was a super fun thing to do during confinement. I truly hope I don't have to that much free time left again. And uh, yeah, as a side note, my ISP router that uh, comes for like free with the contract has a media center, USB sharing, wireless access point with guests. So that, that would be enough. You just plug a disc, right? So I hope you liked uh, this pretty light uh, 25 minutes. And if you have any question, I am here. Hopefully, if I did this right, I'm dressed in the same way. Hopefully. <laughs>